In order to describe fluid flows, we need various variables like pressure, velocity and stresses. These different variables are of different types. We distinguish scalars, vectors and more generally tensors. Scalars and vectors you already know. To the left you see an example of a scalar field, the distribution of the pressure at the Earth's surface, a pressure map. Pressure only has a magnitude and does not have a direction. On the right hand side we have a vector field. This is the wind at 10 meters above the surface. The wind has both a magnitude, its speed and a direction. The direction is here indicated by the direction of the wind barbs. The magnitude is given by the flags at the end of the wind barbs, but additionally it's also given by the color scale. So to summarize, the main distinction between a scalar and a vector is that a vector has a direction and a scalar has not. Since this story is going to be a bit more complex, we're going to do this very systematically. Well, we start with two columns. The first one shows the type of the variable, the second one gives an example. But you already see that there are two more lines that are not yet filled, so we want to do something a bit more general. And so we want to give all of these variable types a common name. We're going to call them tensors. The thing that distinguishes the different types then is the order of the tensor. That is given in the third column. The scalar has order 0 and a vector has order 1. What the order actually tells you is how many directions are involved in the tensor. For a scalar, there is no direction involved. The thing only has a value. And for a vector, the number of directions is just 1, the direction of the vector. Later on, we will see that there are also tensors where more than one direction is relevant. But before we get there, let's have a closer look at what a vector actually is. For that, it is good to keep in mind that a vector is only defined by its magnitude and direction. We do not need a coordinate system for a vector to exist. It's like the same way as this swan that can simply fly in a certain direction with a certain speed. No coordinate system needed. So, the general case is that a vector is, well, just a vector. However, as soon as we want to do something practical with it, it is usually necessary to define a coordinate system. Then we have to define the components of the vector that fit that particular coordinate system. Together, these three components construct the total vector. In this way, we can build a vector from multiple component vectors. So, the components would be ux, uy, and UZ. But we can go one step further. We can also separate the direction and the magnitude for those components. The direction of the component is given by the unit vector in the co given coordinate direction, for example in the Z direction, and the magnitude of the component is given by a scalar, in this case UZ. We should keep in mind that the unit vectors define the coordinate system. Often we call the axis of a coordinate system x, y, and z. But later on, it will become clear that it is sometimes also practical to number them as 1, 2, and 3. These two methods are completely equivalent, and they can be used to describe exactly the same vector. Once we know the length of the components, the length of the vector itself is simply determined from the components using the three-dimensional equivalent of Pythagoras. It's important to realize that the length of the components depends on, on the choice of your coordinate system. So here we have a blue vector in a green coordinate system. And although the original vector does not change, the components change if we change the coordinate system. So to return to our swan, as soon as you see components in relation to a vector, you know that there is a coordinate system involved somewhere either explicitly or implicitly. Okay, let's go back to our table now. We now know that as soon as we introduce a coordinate system, we can talk about the components of a tensor. The number of components depends on the order of the tensor and the number of dimensions we, dimensions we consider. In three dimensions, a scalar has one component and a vector has three components. The or order also determines the number of indices when you write down a tensor in component notation that's shown in the last rightmost column. Okay, now finally it's time to move forward. If we have tensors of order 0 and 1, there should also be tensors of order 2. And indeed there are. The example that we're going to use here is that of a stress. We already know that the number of components then should be 9, 
it's the square of 3. And that in component notation, we have to use two indices. So why is a stress a second order tensor? Well, that has to do with the fact that the stress is a force that acts on a surface. The force is a vector quantity. It has both a magnitude and a direction. But also the surface is defined by a vector, the vector normal to the surface. We also call this the normal vector. So in order to understand the effect of the stress on a given surface, we need to define both the direction of the force and the direction of the surface. So two directions are involved. Well, that is as far as the most frequently used tensors go, up to order two. But in the context of fluid mechanics, there is at least one third order tensor that is worth mentioning, the alternating tensor. This tensor has three to the power three, that is 27 elements. In fact, the alternating tensor is one of two special tensors. The first one is the Kronecker delta. It's a second order tensor for which the components are only equal to one if the indices i and j are equal. Then we come to the alternating tensor. For this, the components are only non-zero if the indices do not contain repeated numbers, for instance, two ones or two threes. If the alternating tensor is non-zero, it is either plus one or minus one. It is positive if the indices are ordered in increasing order, and it is negative if they are ordered in decreasing order. For this, you have to keep in mind that the ordering wraps around. So indices two, three, and one, in fact, are also in increasing order as you wrap back to one after, after the two and the three. Now to summarize, keep in mind the following. Scalars and vectors are just special cases of general tensors. Secondly, tensors are independent of the coordinate system. And finally, in a three-dimensional coordinate system, tensors have three to the power n elements, where n is the order of the tensor.